Welcome to today's webinar, Diversity and Inclusion, Lip Service or Lifesaver. During today's presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. If during the program you would like to submit a question, please use the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen. Type your question into the box at the bottom and click Send. Just a reminder, if you would like to listen to today's presentation via your computer speakers, you must have Flash installed and enabled. If you have technical difficulties at any time, you may contact our Help Desk at 1-877-297-2901. And now, I'll turn our program over to Magali Flores. Magali, welcome to the program. Thank you for that introduction, Diana. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this Campbell Institute webinar series titled Diversity and Inclusion, Lip Service or Lifesaver. The Campbell Institute is the center of EHS at the National Safety Council, and what we try to do is present leading edge topics in EHS through our webinars. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be distributed via email in the next few days. This includes all PowerPoint slides shown on the screen. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Michael Bach. Michael Bach is the founder and CEO of the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion. Mr. Bach is internationally recognized as a thought leader and subject matter expert in the fields of diversity, inclusion, and employment equity, bringing a vast knowledge of leading practices in a life setting to his work. He has deep experience in strategy development, stakeholder engagement, training and development, and research among a plethora of other skills and experiences. Mr. Bach has a postgraduate certificate in diversity management for, from Cornell University and also holds the Cornell Certified Diversity Professional Advanced Practitioner designation. Last but not least, Mr. Bach will be presenting on the topic of diversity and inclusion at the Campbell Institute Symposium in Seattle this February. Without further, further ado, I will hand it over to Michael. Thanks so much, uh, Magali, and it's a pleasure to uh, be able to present to you all today. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, I, uh, I was a bit cheeky with the title uh, um, Lip Service or Lifesaver, but really what we're talking about is diversity and inclusion as being an imperative. And over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, why I believe it is an imperative. Uh, for any employer in this day and age. Um, uh, a little bit about my organization, just so you know who I am. I know most of you are from the United States. Uh, I am from Canada, and I run the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion. We are an educational charity, and our mandate is to educate Canadians on the value of diversity and inclusion. Uh, we do this by doing a lot of stuff, putting on in-person events, conferences, webinars throughout the year. Uh, you can find out more about my organization by going to our website at ccdi.ca. Um, these are just a, a selection of our employer partners, uh, employers that we work with. We have over 200 employer partners that we work with. Uh, and our goal is to help them create inclusive workplaces for their people. A little bit about me, uh, more than what was said in the introduction, um, I'm not an HR person. That's not how I came to be in the diversity space. Uh, I have uh, a career uh, mostly in consulting and uh, in the IT space. Um, but I had the wonderful pleasure and opportunity when I was in the IT consulting practice at KPMG here in Canada to take on the role of the, the leader of diversity and inclusion within the firm. It did become my full-time job, and I held that role for seven years before being the Deputy Chief Diversity Officer for KBMG International, and I had the pleasure of working in, uh, with KBMG firms around the world in 152 countries, including uh, my favorite, the United States. Um, I've won some awards. Uh, they look lovely on a shelf. That's all you need to know about them. So uh, the first thing I want to do is start by defining some of the language because all of you came into this conversation today with some preconceived notions about what these words mean. And uh, so I'm going to give you some perspective on that. So the first word I want to talk about is representation. And 
The word, rep you may be thinking, why on earth do I want to talk about representation? Well, it's, um, representation is part of the diversity conversation, but it is not the entire diversity conversation. And sometimes we end up kind of getting trapped in the conversation around representation because it primarily focuses on visible differences. It focuses on uh, groups that have been marginalized and underrepresented, things like women, people of color, people with disabilities, uh, Native Americans or indigenous people in Canada, um, religious minorities, LGBTQ2 plus peoples. But that is just part of the conversation. That really is just scratching the surface on what true diversity is. A guy named Andrea Tapius, who you may be familiar with, he used to run the or an organization called Diversity Best Practices. He said this, that diversity is the mix. Diversity is about all of the things that make us different. It's about our ethnicity and our gender, but it's also about our thinking style, our learning style. It's about where we went to school, where we work in the country, what's our role within an organization, do we have children, and so on and so forth. It's about all of the things that shape our perspectives because every aspect of our life, all the things that make us unique, are also the things that help, uh, help shape the way we see the world. Inclusion is getting the mix to work well together. And there... Um, in Canada, we have a, a governor general, which I won't even begin to explain what that is, but um, a, a, the governor general of Canada who recently retired, he said that Canada is a wonderful experiment in diversity. And I would argue that Canada is actually a wonderful experiment in inclusion. And that's because the diversity exists whether you like it or not. The inclusion is the hard part. And uh, we've got people in Canada, as you do in the United States, from uh, different communities working side by side that under different circumstances would not well work well together. As an example, we've got people from Israel working side by side with people from Palestine, or people from India working side by side with people from Pakistan, where in, in their part of the world that wouldn't happen. And so inclusion is about taking all of those, those pieces of the puzzle and making sure that they work well together. The other word that comes into mind is equity. And that is defined as a fair and just treatment of all potential and existing members of the workplace community through the creation of opportunities to address historic and current disadvantaged uh, for underrepresented populations. But the reality is we get, different, we, we get confused between the words equality and equity. And you'll see the image on the screen, those who are visually abled. Equality is about treating everyone the same. Equity is about treating people how they need to be treated. Uh, there's a, a bit of a famous quote um, that's, that said, uh, equality is giving everyone a shoe. Equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. And as you see in the image, it's about making sure that you're treating people how they need to be treated, as opposed to making sure you're treating everyone the same. Another word that's part of this conversation is intersectionality. And you may or may not be familiar with, uh, with the history of this term, but it was coined by uh, a woman by the name of Kimberly Crenshaw in the late 1980s. It, it had been around before her, but she kind of uh, started to put some lines around it and define it in, in particular around the, the civil rights conversation. And, and long story short, uh, she was arguing, she's a lawyer and a professor, and she was arguing that the circumstances of an um, African-American woman uh, in employment were very different than those of women, specifically white women, and African-American men. And she was successful in arguing that, that case. Um, but to give it, I'm going to give it in, in Canadian terms, um, and this is from our, our, um, our census from 2006. And what, as you see here, it's the intersections of gender, education, and recency of immigration. What we find in the upper left-hand corner of the table is that Canadian-born men, regardless of their race or ethnicity, 
with a university degree have a median income of $62,566. Canadian-born women, uh, again, regardless of race or ethnicity, with a university degree are $44,545. So already we see that women are making about 70 cents on the dollar uh, if all things are equal. Then if we jump down to the bottom right-hand corner, uh, we see that recent immigrant women, and recent is defined as being in the country less than five years, without a university degree, have a median income of $14,233. Now, the point I'm trying to make, uh, and what this data shows us, is that we can't treat all people the same just because they're part of one group. So we can't treat all women the same in this example, because we see, whether it's recency of immigrants, Im immigration, or it's university degree, uh, we see that there are mitigating circumstances, and it's important to understand the intersections of that diversity. The last thing I want to talk about is accommodation. And I'm sure this is a word that you're very familiar with, but specifically I want to talk about accommodation related to pe persons with disabilities. And the, the term is defined as referring to the provision of conditions, equipment, or environment that enable an individual to effectively perform his or her job. And I'm going to give you some examples of accommodations. So uh, a wheelchair ramp, right? That's an accommodation for people who are wheelchair users. However, that ramp is not exclusively used for people in wheelchairs. Parents with strollers people who are uh, delivery people, um, lawyers who carry around really large briefcases or wheelie bags, um, elderly people. There's lots of benefits to that ramp to enable people to access facilities that may have stairs. Another example, of course, is Braille. Braille on buttons helps people who are visually impaired and who need to access, whether it's a bathroom, an elevator, anywhere that Braille may be used. Another example, of course, is a sign language interpreter. So maybe used in this, you see the image here, we've got a doctor who is speaking to a patient who is hearing impaired, and the uh, interpreter is uh, um, helping them to understand the conversation. But there are lots of other forms of accommodation. And I'm going to give you a couple examples here. The chair is a form of accommodation. So think about this. Did you come to work today and bring your own chair? For the majority of you, the answer is probably no. But if a wheelchair user comes to work, they bring their own chair. And therefore, if you're in a meeting with a, that person, the chair is an accommodation for you. It's an accommodation for people who are able-bodied. Another example is the light bulb. Now, I realize you're probably thinking, how is that an accommodation? Well, let me tell you a story. Uh, a number of years ago, I worked uh, in a, a place that is a very old building. And the lighting was terrible. And uh, we put desks in lots of places where there weren't it traditionally meant to be desks. And it wasn't the best space. And we hired a woman who was uh, visually impaired. She was completely blind. And I took her to her desk, and I sat her down. And the first words out of my mouth were, Doreen, I'm really sorry about the lighting. We'll get it fixed. And she sort of looked in my general direction and said, you idiot, that lighting is for you. If the lights go out, I can function without a problem. What's your issue? And that was the moment for me that I realized that lights are an accommodation for sighted people. I'm sitting in a room right now. The lights are on. Uh, just as the slides are an accommodation for sighted people. Um, everything in life is an accommodation. It just depends on whether or not it's accommodating the majority or it's accommodating the minority. The reality of the situation is very, very simple, and that's this. Diversity is a fact. Diversity exists when you have two human beings in a room, because it's about all of the things that make them different. And that we have 
no two people that have identical lived experiences, even uh, uh, identical twins, do not have the same exact lived experience. Diversity is a fact whether you like it or not. It exists whether you like it or not. Just not liking something doesn't make it go away. Inclusion is a choice. And I would argue that it's a choice that every employer should be making if they want to remain relevant. But it is still a choice. And there's nothing that says that employers have to be inclusive. Yes, there are laws in place uh, that protect people, um, sometimes employment, um, in, uh, in other aspects of, uh, of their, their life. But there's always a way around it. And I'll give you an example uh, from my, my, uh, my state, my province, called Ontario. In 2012, the Ontario Human Rights Commission issued a policy statement that said that it, was, it would be grounds for a human rights complaint if an employer declined employment to someone for not having quote unquote Canadian experience. And this is a phenomenon that we see in Canada in particular where newcomers to this country, when they don't have Canadian experience, it's, it's viewed very negatively. Um, and even um, uh, if you've got you know, a master's from Oxford University, um, You'd say, you know, people would say, oh, well, you, you know, it's, it's not a Canadian university. Uh, my husband, in fact, uh, is an American. He's uh, from Missouri, and he's an accountant. He's worked for companies like H&R Block and Sprint Nextel. And in moving to Canada, he heard, well, you don't have any Canadian experience. And so the Ontario Human Rights Commission issued this policy statement. Do you think anything actually changed for newcomers to this country? Not a bit. Um, instead of hearing, well, you don't have any Canadian experience, they heard things like, well, we've decided to go a different way. Uh, you don't have exactly the skills we're looking for, any number of excuses. But at the end of the day, it was the same thing. Inclusion is a choice, and it's a choice that we as employers have to make in order to make sure that we stay relevant in this conversation. So let's talk about some numbers um, because I work for uh, I worked for accountants for the better part of a decade, and the numbers really tell us um, why uh, this is such a critical conversation. Um, I have said that we are in a bit of a, a demographic tsunami, and uh, I'm going to give you uh, examples of some numbers here. Um, so here's what we know, and these are mostly from uh, census information. So about 50% of, of our workforces are females, about 49% in, in uh, Canada, and it's 48% in the United States. Now obviously there's, uh, there's big shifts there. We, uh, we know that um, Certain industries have higher representation of women and lower representation in other industries. So for example, uh, nursing degrees, uh, over 90% of nursing degrees go to women every year, uh, whereas uh, engineering as a profession, only about 25% of engineering degrees go to women. Um, but on average, we've got 50%, uh, on just shy of 50% of the workforce is female. People of color or racialized people have reached uh, anywhere between, it's about 23% in Canada, um, but it's almost 40% in the United States. And um, obviously that shifts in larger cities like New York, uh, San Francisco, Atlanta, Toronto, um, where there are the number of people of color or racialized people exceeds 50%. Uh, and in some places, in smaller towns and, and even in, in parts of whole parts of states, um, uh, that number can drop dramatically low. 
but that number is only increasing. Uh, so we continue to see increases amongst uh, people of color. In fact, it has been estimated that within the next, uh, I believe it's 15 years, people of color nationally in the United States will exceed white people. People with disabilities has reached um, anywhere between 1 in 5 and 1 in 7, depending on the study that you believe. And there's a, a few reasons why that's the case, three of them that I will point to directly. First off, um, we have an aging workforce. And I'm going to talk about uh, aging workforces uh, in just a, uh, the age of the workforce in just a second. Um, but the older you get, the more likely you are to have a disability. We also have a much broader understanding of disability than we have traditionally thought of. So traditionally, you would think wheelchair, blind, deaf. But our understanding of disability now includes episodic disability. It includes uh, chronic illness. Um, it includes addiction, mental health, mental illness, so on and so forth. So our understanding of disability has changed dramatically. Last but not least is the veteran population. Particularly in the United States, we have uh, less of a veteran population here in Canada, but still both populations coming back from wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and uh, ongoing places, uh, they're coming back with injuries, um, which means that the population of people with disabilities is grow going up. Next, we've got our indigenous or Native American population. And um, in Canada, we talk about the indigenous population separately from uh, people of color um, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, but in the Canadian context, uh, indigenous people make up about 5% of the Canadian population. In the US, Native Americans, uh, it's a smaller percentage. I think it's about uh, just shy of three, if, I'm not, if I remember correctly. Um, and, but just to put it in perspective, uh, the indigenous population is the fastest growing population. In Canada, the indigenous population every five years grows by about 20 to 25 percent, whereas the non-indigenous or non-Native American population grows by less than 2 percent. It's about 1.6 percent. So we see a dramatic shift in the native population in both countries um, over, year over year. And um, they also are a very young population. So the average age of an indigenous person is about 30 to 32, uh, whereas a non-indigenous person, the average age is about 40 to 44. Another thing that's really impacting this, this demographic tsunami is uh, the newcomer population, the immigrant population. Um, we bring in, uh, in Canada, it's about uh, 315, for 2018 it was 315,000 newcomers. And in the United States, it was uh, just shy of a million people immigrated uh, in 2018. Um, so that has an incredible shift. And uh, the numbers of immigrants are not going down. It's only going up. Um, and the reality is that the countries, the source countries of immigration have shifted dramatically over the years. Um, so 100 years ago, uh, immigration to the Canada and, and what is now the United States, what is now Canada and, and the United States, rather, uh, the countries, source countries were England, Ireland, Italy, uh, and uh, in Canada's case, France. In 2018, the predominant countries of immigration, for the United States, the number one country is Mexico. But for, for both countries, it's India, China, and the Philippines. So that has a dramatic impact on our workforce when you consider that in Canada's case, um, by 2020, we will bring in 350,000 newcomers a year. Um, and in the United States, uh, I think the number was 1.2 or 1.3 million. Uh, 
um, that is, in, in our case, that is 1% of our population. So 1% of the population will be immigrant every year. And the reason why our immigrant numbers are so high is because our birth rate is low and getting lower. The birth rate in, in Canada and the United States is about 1.6, 1.7. And in order to maintain our population, so one in, one out, we need a birth rate of 2.1. Um, so we're in population decline. And in order to maintain our population, let alone grow it, and the reason why we want to do that, grow our population, is so that employers can grow their organizations. Because with, obviously without employees, you can't grow. But in order to do that, we need to have high levels of immigration to compensate for a birth rate that has been dropping since the 1960s. I mentioned uh, um, an aging workforce. We, in fact, now have five generations in the workforce. It's the first time in history that we have had this, uh, this population. Um, and, and I'll just go through the generations if you're not familiar with them. Uh, looking at the picture on the far left, we've got our traditionalists. Uh, traditionalists are now well into their 80s and above. So then the majority of workplaces will not still have traditionalists in them. However, there's some organizations, say the retail sector, Walmart, Home Depot, that still rely uh, pretty heavily on a traditionalist population in the workforce. Uh, next to, to him is our baby boomers. Baby boomers uh, are uh, now on their way out of the workforce, the first of which uh, hit 65 in about 2009. However, because of the financial crisis of 2008, we're seeing people working well beyond 65. And so that has uh, a lingering effect on the workforce. The middle uh, picture, the woman is uh, Generation X, my generation. Uh, we are now running the place. We, the largest population in the workforce today is Generation X. And that's followed by Millennials, uh, which is the next picture, those pesky Millennials. Uh, I was being quite facetious when I, I disparaged millennials um, because they are the oldest of which is now almost 40 years old. So they're no longer those pesky millennials as much as just our workforce. Um, and very soon they will become the dominant uh, part of the workforce because, of course, Gen Xers are actually starting to retire themselves. Last but not least, uh, the picture on the right is um, the I generation or Generation uh, Z. We say Z in Canada, I apologize. Um, and uh, the majority of uh, you on the call today will not have Generation Z in your workforce yet um, because they are the oldest of which is now around 23. But you're going to start seeing um, a, uh, certainly that generation coming into the workforce. Particularly if you're in retail, you absolutely already have uh, that generation. Starbucks, Burger King uh, has already been dealing with that generation. So the reality of that situation, though, is you may have uh, a person who's in their 70s or 80s reporting into a person who's in their 20s. And there is a big impact on expect or a big uh, difference in expectations about work-life balance, uh, management, et cetera. Uh, and so it's important consideration. Interesting thing uh, about generations that I just re recently read a report, their expectations are most like the traditionalists. Um, so we're seeing a generation that is expecting to get into a job uh, and stay with a company for their entire career. The last uh, thing that I'll point to, and there's lots of other uh, of other stats that I could uh, put up um, related to the changing demographics of the workforce, but is is graduation rate. So graduation rates uh, we we have seen shift dramatically over the past uh, 30 years, uh, more than 30 years, almost 40 years, um, where women now take home 60% of undergraduate degrees and almost 55% of postgraduate degrees. And that number just is, again, an interesting statistic. Uh, the number of 
the year, the school year in which uh, women started to take home the majority of undergraduate degrees was actually 1979-1980. Um, and that's both for Canada and the US. It was just over 50% in that year. And it has not dropped below 50% since then. So who's left? Well, it's this guy. And I call him Bob. His name may not be Bob, but let's go with it. Um, he's straight, white, able-bodied, Christian man, probably lives in the suburbs, drives a station wagon, has 2.2 kids. But by definition, Bob is diverse because Bob is different than me. He's different than some of you on the call. Um, now, I want to be very clear that I'm not talking about marginalization and underrepresentation. The Bobs of the world have, have had it pretty good for the past 2,000 years. Um, but it's important that Bob be engaged in the conversation. But one of the things that I get asked all the time is, um, how many straight, white, able-bodied men are there? And so we ran the numbers. And um, I'm going to look at it from both Canada and the United States. And we call them SWAMs, straight, white, able-bodied men. And the, if I look at the total population of our countries, 35 million for Canada, 327 million for the United States. Canada obviously uh, seems a little tiny comparatively, but we'll move on. But then let's look at the working age population, because that's what I really care about is how, what is the working age population? So in Canada, it's 23 million. In the United States, it's 206 and a half million. If I then take out working age women, and uh, incidentally, these numbers are from Statistics Canada and the United States Census Bureau. Um, if I take it, working age women uh, at 11.8 million for Canada and 107, just over 107 million for the United States, I'm left with a working age male population of 11.5 million or just under 100 million for the United States, or as you see, 49.5% uh, or 48.1% of the workforce is male. So then if I take out racialized men or men of color and indigenous men or Native American men, um, as you see, 3.7 million and 813,000 for Canada and 44 million and 1.3 million, 1.4 million for the United States. If I take those two groups out, I'm left with white men at 30.1% for Canada and 26.6% for the United States. I then take out uh, gay men, and I should also point that includes uh, bisexual men. So, um, and I, I'll, if you don't know, there is relatively little data on the LGBT, LGBTQ uh, communities. Um, so it, it's sort of believed it's somewhere between six to eight percent of the population, um, but the stats are pretty lousy. So using a conservative number, I took 5% of white men, uh, 578,000 for Canada and 2.7 and a half million for the United States are gay or bisexual men who are white. And if I take them out, I'm left with a straight white male population of 27.6% for Canada and 25.3% for the United States. If I then take out men living with a disability, and we do have better statistics here, it's about 884,000 for Canada and 9.9 .9 million for the United States. I am then left with a population of 23.8% straight white able-bodied men for Canada or 20.5% for the United States. And I, I will be honest, when I uh, ran the numbers for the United States, I actually expected it to be higher than Canada. But in looking at the, um, particularly the men of color, the people of color population, it's so much higher um, than, uh, than Canada because it, it all, it's almost 40% compared to 23% in, in Canada. Um, so 20.5%, which was pretty dramatic. And, and I will, I can say that that number changes pretty dramatically in larger centers uh, like Toronto, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, et cetera, where the uh, population of people of color exceeds 50%. Uh, in the case of Toronto, as an example, um, the number of straight white able-bodied men is below 15%. Uh, 
And the reason why this is important is it's a, it's a bit of a litmus test. It's a bit of an indicator to say, what does our workforce look like? And how does it compare to um, the, uh, the uh, available talent, available statistics? Like I said, there are, are mitigating factors that um, have an effect and change things, profession, geography, et cetera. Um, but overall, if you look at these numbers and if you look at your workforce and say, wow, you know, 80% of our people are straight, white, able-bodied men, then you just have to ask yourself the question, why? Why are you missing out on such a large population of potential talent? It may be that uh, you know, women are not interested in long-haul trucking. That is, a, that is an actual thing. Uh, it may be that people of color are not interested in uh, teaching in academia. I, I'm, and these are not facts. I'm, that is not a fact. I'm just making things up. The, the, my point is you need to ask the questions. You need to say, why is our population not in line with the available talent? So what does the research tell us, tell us just very quickly? Um, uh, I could fill a room full of research that shows the positive impact um, to organizations from a diversity and inclusion perspective. And I'll, I'll just point out a couple of reports here. Um, this is from a report by uh, Deloitte out of Australia called Waiter is That Inclusion in My Soup? It's a great report. I would encourage you to, to look it up. Um, and what it found was that organizations with a strong commitment to diversity and where their people felt included, so high levels of inclusion, saw an uptick of engagement. And of course, engagement is kind of the the potential uh, panacea that we all look to. Um, but they also saw lower potential risks associated with the workforce. And this is where it comes back to health and safety, um, is there are significant benefits to, uh, to mitigating safety. But just coming back to engagement, as I mentioned, um, there's an increase in the engagement scores. Organizations with a high commitment to diversity and where they also had employees who did not feel included, where, in where inclusion scores were low, they still saw an engagement lift of 20% in comparison to organizations with little to no commitment to diversity and where uh, their employees didn't feel included. It was a 20% lift. Whereas organizations with a strong commitment to diversity and where their employees feel included, see a 101% lift on engagement scores in comparison to those in the low, low category. We also see that there are significant potential uh, impacts on organizational performance. And I'm just going to talk about um, uh, the two that I have highlighted, safety incidents and absenteeism. What the research tells us is that Organizations with a significant commitment to diversity and inclusion see lower levels of safety incidents and lower levels of absenteeism and presenteeism. And what it comes back to is trust. And uh, organizations that are diverse and inclusive, that have made a strong commitment to this, where their people feel in engaged, are able to mitigate safety uh, potential safety risks far better and decrease safety incidents and, and reduce the rate of absenteeism as well as presenteeism um, quite significantly in comparison to other organizations. Um, this is another report by McKinsey and Company. Uh, this is from 2014. And what it found was that uh, essentially organizations with um, gender diverse boards and executive teams outperformed uh, their competition financially by 15%. And ethnically or racially diverse companies at the board and executive team level um, uh, outperformed by 35%. And this was just updated in 2018. And what they found, in fact, same comparison um, uh, that the gender diverse companies, the number went up from 15% to 21. But interestingly, 
from an ethno-racial perspective, it actually dropped by 2%. So my team is actually doing some analysis right now to understand why it has dropped. This is the last thing I'll talk about, uh, and that's from uh, a report from CEB. And as you see on the slide, there are significant uh, impacts to organizational performance, whether it's around retention or collaboration or success in new markets. There is no research that shows that diversity and inclusion adversely impacts an organization. There is some opinion out there, but there is no actual quantifiable research uh, done by a reputable body that shows that there is a negative impact on that. So the last thing I want to talk about before we open it up for questions is inclusive leadership and the six Cs. Um, this is a report again by Deloitte called The Six Signature Traits of Inclusive Leadership. And uh, again, I encourage you to Google it and download, take a read. It's a great report. Um, they interviewed a dozen uh, CEOs and did a survey of over 1,000 people to identify what are the six signature traits of inclusive leadership. And the reason why I'm including this in my presentation is because this is um, the presentation that I'm going to be giving in Seattle in February as part of the symposium. So it's a bit of a teaser for you. If you haven't already booked your ticket, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to register today. Um, but my presentation is on uh, the six signature traits and the six Cs. And they are commitment, courage, cognizance, curiosity, cultural intelligence, and collaboration. And I am going to uh, go into a, a lot more detail uh, at the symposium in, in Seattle on these traits and on the research um, and uh, talk about how, um, uh, how uh, people can embrace these and, and change their own behavior to be inclusive leaders. Because at the end of the day, um, as the research shows us, tone from the top, commitment of leadership to diversity and inclusion is the number one impactful activity um, uh, to ensure success. If you have an engaged and actively engaged uh, leadership, you will have uh, more, you're more likely to be successful in your diversity and inclusion work in comparison to organizations that do not have actively engaged leaders. Um, the point of all of this is that we are in this demographic tsunami and change is coming at us rapidly. And the conversation on diversity and inclusion is one that has, it's become uh, part of everyday conversation. You know, we talk about diversity on a daily basis. I know uh, in the United States, uh, in the most recent election, the midterm election, we saw an amazing uh, raft of, of change of the, the face of your uh, elected representatives. We've got Native Americans, we've got Muslims, we've got more women than we've ever seen in history. And I, I think we're moving from what has traditionally been lip service where we say, oh yes, we're committed to diversity. You know, it's a statement on your website. That's not good enough anymore. Um, we, we now have generations of people who will look to your website and, and look for examples uh, of inclusive behavior. They want to know that they are going to be successful in your organization. They're looking at the pictures of your leadership. And when they see organizations that have an entirely white and entirely male uh, leadership team, they're saying, well, how is that? How are you really diverse and inclusive? They're calling companies out on the table. Um, and so we are seeing now more than ever employers that are moving to, uh, to really consider diversity and inclusion a lifesaver, um, that they are layering diversity and inclusion over top of the entire organization to ensure that they will be successful going forward. And with that, I want to open it up to uh, questions from all of you. So I will hand it back to uh, Magli. Uh, 
Thanks, Michael. As a reminder to all attendees, if you have questions for Michael, please type them into the lower hand, left hand corner of your screen. Before getting into Q&A though, I would like to give a quick overview of the diversity and inclusion presentation that will be occurring at the symposium. So we have found that diversity and inclusion leads to a more engaged employee and an engaged employee is a safer one. This is why diversity and inclusion has been brought up as an emerging topic in EHS and Michael has grac graciously set the foundation, as he will at the symposium. Speakers from Boeing and a new, newly secured speaker from De Delta Airlines will dive into the practical use in EHS as seen in their organizations. If you're interested in learning more about uh, from speakers in this setting, I encourage you to join us at the 2019 Symposium in Seattle, Washington. This event features topics such as safety, safety data and analytics, fatigue, the gig economy, and SIF prevention. You can find more information at the URL on the screen, which is the Institute.org forward slash symposium. With that, we'll go ahead and start a Q our Q&A session. So Michael, one question that we have coming in is, um, what can I do in my average day as an EHS professional to help my organization become more diverse and inclusive? Yeah, Megley, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we as uh, individuals um, have a role to play in um, creating inclusive work environments. You know, it's not just one person's job. And um, there are a few things that I can point to. You know, first and foremost um, is be willing to do some self-examination. Um, if you, you need to look inside, you need to be very introspective. Um, so examining, you know, like what biases you have. Um, what uh, what are your sources of information? Like, where do you go if you have a tough question? Who's your your mentor? Who's your trusted advisor? Um, and um, figuring out, you know, are you getting a diverse perspective? Um, do you have you you have biases? We all have biases. Um, and but what are those biases? And are you dealing with them? So being introspective, and and I will give a shout out to the Harvard Implicit Association Test. Um, which you can uh, you can Google. Um, it's a quick little test that you can do to help you understand where some of your biases, unconscious biases, may exist. Um, but you have to be willing to uh, do that self-reflective uh, work. You also have to be willing to hear feedback from others. Um, you don't necessarily need to agree with everything that's said to you. Um, but it's important to listen to the feedback of others because you may be presenting yourself in one way and may be received in a completely different manner. Um, I think it's also uh, imperative that, that people um, take an active role, that they, um, that they uh, stand up to inequity. You know, when you hear a joke or offhanded comment um, that uh, you... Um, you uh, you stand up to it. You you don't let it pass. And and I, I'm a big believer that jokes and offhanded comments are are far more infectious than you know true racism and sexism, homophobia, um, because those real uh, th those make up a small percentage um, in comparison to uh, the 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 jokes and offhanded comments. But if you hear something, you need to say something. I apologize for using that overuse statement, but you need to be able to call it out. And, and you don't have to do it in the moment, but certainly after it happens, you, you go to the person and say, listen, that wasn't okay. Um, uh, and, and I think everyone has a, a role to play in, in creating that safe space and in creating the inclusive uh, 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 environment. Great. Thank you. Another question that we have in is, you spoke about about active engagement. What are some examples of such? Mm, yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and there is a big difference. And it's uh, the other um, the other term I would use is ally. Uh, 
And there's a difference between being an armchair ally versus an active ally. And it's the same um, with leaders who are active in uh, their work. So, uh, you know, oftentimes we'll see our CEO, our president, our provost who'll, who'll you know, they've read the marketing notes, they've read the bullet points that were given to them, and they can spout them off. But at the end of the day, you know, they're just going back to doing their job. At the end of the speech, they're not really um, living it. They're not uh, challenging perceptions. They're not um, taking ownership of the diversity and inclusion conversation. And, and that's the difference. Being, an act, being actively engaged in this conversation as a leader is, one, taking ownership of it and saying, you know what, I, I, I'm not passing the buck to someone else. I am taking this on. Um, and making sure that they're living that value, that they themselves are examining their own biases, they're examining who they get their advice from, um, they're challenging the status quo, uh, they're making sure that policies and procedures are being changed to ensure that we are um, in, you know, creating that environment, that inclusive environment that we're, we are recruiting from different talent pools. They live the values. And um, that's a big difference. And I've, I, you know, we work with uh, over 200 employers. And you know, I will be honest and say that there's a fraction of, of those employers that have really actively engaged uh, leadership teams. Um, I was giving a presentation uh, just a few weeks ago, last week sometime, and um, it was to a plumbing company. And I, I have to admit, I went into that conversation with a little trepidation because, you know, plumbing is perceived as a pretty blue-collar, roughneck kind of uh, culture. And the CEO uh, got up before me, and he gave, I think, one of the best speeches I have heard where he really was honest and said, I don't know all this stuff, but I'm willing to learn. And he cared so much about the culture of the organization that as we went through the day and people told stories about their lived experience in the organization, and I'm talking about women and, and people of color and so on, that you could see the look on his face of, you know, sometimes horror, um, but more, more importantly, he was saying, you know what, we're going to do something about this. And that's the difference. It's, it's action. Um, it's, it's that willingness to learn and take ownership and, and really move the conversation forward. Thanks, Michael. Another question is, for small organizations with less resources than larger corporations, how would you suggest we get started on diversity and inclusion? That's a great question, Magalie. And, and uh, you know, I get that a lot. You know, obviously larger organizations, big banks and tech companies, they've got big, fat, juicy budgets, and they can spend a whole lot of money on this. But 98% of uh, the workforce the, uh, where people work is in small to medium-sized enterprises where they may or may not even have an HR person. Um, so, you know, there are, are four steps to a diversity journey. The first is a business case. So writing a business case, that answers the why question. And that doesn't need to be a really complicated document. That's one page is quite sufficient. Um, but it answers the why are you doing this question. And I have always said that the business case is the fundamental piece of information you need to uh, drive what you're doing. If you look at your business case and it isn't relevant anymore, then you obviously have to revisit the business case. But in the near decade that I was doing this work for, for one of the world's largest accounting firms, I could go back to the business case and say, yeah, that's still relevant. So that's the first step. The second is to do a bit of an assessment. Now, uh, assessments, you know, also known as audits, um, they can be big or small, but you can learn a lot from um, uh, doing some focus groups with different groups, say one with your African-American population, one with your Hispanic, Latino population, uh, one with your Asian population, one with your women, your people with disabilities, your Native Americans, your LGBTQ2+, um, 
and do a focus group, do some surveys. This is all stuff you can do yourself to better understand what the experiences are of your people. Um, and then use that information to identify where you may have some issues. Also part of that should be a policy review. So going through your policies with a diversity lens and say, okay, is there something about this policy that may be exclusionary to one group versus another? And it may be a simple thing. For example, do you use the term maternity leave versus the term parental leave? Do you have the same benefits, say, for a man who wants to take parental leave? Um, do you have the same benefits for same-sex couples that want to take parental leave? So looking at that, and, and that language can be very, very simple, but also very exclusionary. So that's the assessment piece. Next is um, uh, the strategy. So you've, you've assessed. Now you know where your issues are. What are you going to do about it? So coming up with some action items, and, and action items can be little things and they can be big things. Um, but action items uh, and changes that um, will have the intended or expect to have the intended impact uh, on changing the culture um, to address the issues that you've identified. And last but not least is measurement. So how are you going to know if you've been successful? And measurement can be as simple as we delivered three workshops, or it can be a really complicated uh, measurement process. And then you rinse and repeat. You go back to the business case, uh, and you do this sort of once a year, once every 18 months, depending on how your, your normal cycles work. Um, and you assess if you've met your goals, you reassess the organization, has the change occurred that you were expecting, and then if it, if it has, great. If not, what are the things that you're going to do uh, to affect change uh, and to address the issues that you've identified? And, and it doesn't have to be really big, dramatic, you know, teams of people. You know, one HR person or one individual within an organization um, can absolutely do that. And, and the other piece, if I can, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but the last thing I'll say is look at this from a safety perspective. So I um, was hired by a, a big utility to develop a positive space, LGBT positive space um, learning program. And I have to admit, I was a little intimidated going into that conversation as well, because again, it's not a culture that I'm used to, but they were having me come in and train people on, on how to create a positive space for LGBT coworkers. And what it all came down to was safety. It was about ensuring that if people were up on a, a pole running an electrical cable, that the person down on the ground was going to have their back. And there are other organizations uh, that have uh, looked at, at this through a safety lens, construction organizations. Um, and there's a great deal of impact that it can have on health and safety in organizations, not to mention, of course, the whole conversation around mental health. So uh, I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thanks, Michael. Um, and I'd like to thank every attendee for their participation in today's webinar. Um, as a reminder, this uh, presentation is being recorded and will be distributed in the next upcoming days via email. With that, Diana, we can close the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Magalie. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this webinar. We appreciate your attention and participation in today's event. You may now disconnect. <laughs>